What if is weird. Last time I made a video about what if, I was kind of cold on this series. Episode 1 felt like an underwhelming reimagining of the first Avenger. Episode 2 had a pitch that just fundamentally did not work for me. But episode 3 was a lot of fun, so 1 for 3. And don't get me wrong, the animation has moments where it's really spectacular and the episodes are usually pretty funny. Like looking back, the Loki impersonating Fury lines are so good. Her mother was an agent? Oh, don't worry about her. I doubt she'd mind, considering she's dead. I don't give a damn about any of them. So good. But the stories are where What If has been losing me. So just like I talked about what I liked and didn't like about episodes 1 through 3, I want to take a very deep dive into episodes 4 through 6. See how they stack up and see if any patterns emerge. Spoiler alert, one will. And spoiler alert for episodes 4 through 6. Episode 4, What If Doctor Strange Lost His Heart Instead of His Hands? What was this episode a what if of? Like, what was I watching? Because it sure felt like the what if was what if Doctor Strange tried to save Christine, the love of his life, from her untimely death. And I watch these things for a living. Like, it is my job to watch movies, specifically Marvel movies. And even I cannot remember what the deal was with Strange and Christine. I thought they were friends who kind of had a thing in the past but then gave up on it because the Marvel Cinematic Universe has about as much sexiness as George Costanza watching Zero Dark Thirty. Did this relationship exist? Was it a formative moment for Strange? I didn't think so. She never comes up again in Infinity War or anything like that. In fact, Christine is barely in Doctor Strange, which is fine. But if the what if hinges on the emotional beating that comes with Stephen Strange attempting to reverse Christine's death, it might help if that relationship mattered to us. Like Tony and Pepper, Wanda and Vision. We've seen MCU characters driven to great and sometimes unreasonable lengths to protect a significant other. But we also usually get a sense for their relationship before that happens. So we understand what they're afraid of losing. But this episode essentially reinvents Christine as Strange's one true love so she can be fridged, killed to motivate the main character. You've seen it happen a lot. Sometimes even like the original Green Lantern comic version with the fridge. So for me, the emotional stakes of the episode felt hollow because the relationship at the foundation of the episode barely existed in my memory. Seeing Strange work tirelessly and sacrificing his sanity to bring Christine back is certainly interesting in theory but I don't understand the decision to base that arc on a relationship that barely exists. This episode also didn't make sense to me as a Marvel fan who is desperately trying to figure out what time travel is in this universe. First time it comes up in the Doctor Strange movie, we get the message, you don't mess with time unless you do, then it's fine. Like, in the movie, they stipulate that there will be consequences, but they're never delivered on. Also, one of the rules is you can't see past your own death, so that's pretty straightforward. Infinity War seems to kind of break this rule since Strange can look into alternate futures including the one where he is dusted, but I guess that doesn't count as being dead, whatever. Then Endgame and Ant-Man and the Wasp teach us that you can kind of also mess with time via the Quantum Realm and you can take Infinity Stones as long as you put everything back the way it was. And messing with time creates branching timelines if you don't. And then in Loki, we learn that the branches are actually bad unless they aren't and you can easily travel through time using little doors that don't cause a problem as long as your meddling doesn't make any big changes in the timeline. Also, this is all controlled by one crazy guy who is trying to stop the timeline from splitting and forming new universes and he's dead now. Okay, sure. It's messy, but sure. However, in this episode, we get even more dumb contradictory rules. Like, you can't change certain points in time, it needs to happen. The Ancient One says that Christine needs to die for Strange to defeat Dormammu, which is tough for us to understand as audience members because in the version of the movie that we saw, the thing that this is a what if of, Doctor Strange does defeat Dormammu and Christine is alive. So like, that's not true. And also not to nitpick Ancient One, not unlike my podcast mostly nitpicking, she says that you can't change a fixed point in time, but Cagliostro, I guess, can? The guy that wrote the books that this is all based on? Like, I assume this character was able to change a fixed point in time, otherwise, how did he know how to do it? Unless his books are just, if I did it, like the O.J. Simpson of this universe. Anyway, then we learn that you can create two timelines within the same universe if you want. It's difficult, but it can be done. Nobody tell the TVA or Kang. 
But um, hey, wait, that doesn't seem correct. It doesn't gel with a past rule of time travel. I can't remember where I heard this. Oh yeah, it was you, the ancient one from Endgame. So which one is it, Tilda? And like, I don't care myself, like I can look past it, but this half hour show probably is not the right time to throw even more messy time travel canon into the universe. And it's unnecessarily messy. You could easily just start the episode with Christine dying and Strange just trying to bring her back to life with a very powerful spell. Because time travel is only one needlessly complicated mechanism introduced in this episode, the other is absorption magic, or the ability to accumulate power by consuming other magical beings. Strange goes to a new library and learns new magic, I guess like dark magic. And why not just start the episode here? Instead of going to Kamartage to fix his hands, Strange goes to Cagliostro's library to save Christine. He's never the Sorcerer Supreme, he's just Doctor Strange Supreme. And Strange goes into this library, begins to absorb different creatures, and this bit is fun. Like, interesting, the animation, other monsters, and pretty creative. Almost makes me wish the whole series was hand-drawn animation, but whatever. Strange absorbs all of these animals, I assume we would see their powers later, and yet he doesn't really do too much with them. We see him do a big hand and make some sandworms during the fight, but I wish we saw Doctor Strange calling on more of these monsters' powers during his fight. So then Doctor Strange gets very powerful, looks a little different, like at one point he's this awesome homunculus thing, but for most of the episode he's just got bags under his eyes and a purple aesthetic. Also he gets the classic Doctor Strange cape which looks so much better. But this is all upended when Strange learns that he is a time twin and needs to absorb his other self to save Christine. So here's the part of the episode that most underwhelmed me. We went through all of this contrivance. A what if within a what if, so that Doctor Strange and Doctor Strange could fight. Why? Who cares? I've complained about mirror villains before, but this is ridiculous. They just shoot different colored blasts. And sometimes Evil Strange uses monster powers, but not nearly enough to justify this fight. It's mostly just orange circles where golden circles usually are. You know what would be cool? If Wong showed up to fight Strange, or the Ancient One, or Kaecilius, or Mordo, or all four of them teaming up to fight this new evil sorcerer. Also, hey, in this universe, did Dormammu just kill everybody? Like in the evil timeline, there was no Doctor Strange to stop Dormammu, so I imagine he just kind of won. Whatever. Or maybe Wong could call the Avengers. We could have the Avengers fight Doctor Strange. That is really fun. Maybe Wanda and Thor would stand a chance against magic, but everyone else would just get destroyed. I'm just very done with this Harry Potter, you do a beam and I do a different kind of beam magic. This stuff peaked in Infinity War when Strange fought Thanos and has never managed to transcend that. So we have this unnecessarily complicated mechanism motivated by forgettable romance that leads to an uninteresting fight. And yet, this is the episode that everyone likes. The one that won a lot of people over. I, I really don't get it. Episode 5, What If Zombies, was way less confusing for me. The premise and execution were relatively straightforward, but my issue is the same as a lot of people. Tone. I felt that the tone of episode 5 was off. It just didn't fit the situation. And yes, later in the episode, Peter tells Hope that his jokes are to honor the memory of those who he lost. Sure, that doesn't explain the humor that comes from Bucky, or Scott, or Hope. I've got Sharon on me. That's your friend. One of the last survivors of the zombie apocalypse. You got no respect. You're not upset by her death at all. I understand being a little cold after being forced to kill everyone close to you, but this feels like another level. I mean, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has a pretty consistent tone that's shared throughout most of the movies. It usually only scales based on specific characters being jokier or less jokey than others and the severity of each situation. And this, the direst situation, is sillier than an Ant-Man movie. Like, there are some parts of this episode that I genuinely enjoyed. Hulk vs. Scarlet Witch, that's a lot of fun. Hope taking center stage is a great decision. Peter's characterization felt right on the money. But everyone else was interchangeable, all throwing out quippy one-liners after killing their best friend. But episode 4 and 5 do deserve a lot of credit for pretty much destroying their respective universes. And to be clear, I do not see a world where anyone makes it out of the Marvel zombie universe regardless of what some people online say. So I appreciate that there are real consequences. But that's episode 5, and this is starting to sound a lot like the original What If video about episodes 1 through 3. One episode was a premise that didn't really work for me, and the other was fun on the surface but lacked anything for me to really latch onto. But then, just like in the last video, they go ahead 
make something like episode six and totally redeem themselves because episode six was terrific. The best episode yet. The premise was perfect. Tony and Killmonger are two of the most interesting characters in the MCU who have never met but happened to canonically be in the same place at the same time, so the pitch writes itself. And we got to see how that chance encounter would change the trajectory of both heroes. Getting to see Tony walking down the wrong path was a delight. He is a complete, unapologetic jerk who you can manipulate with a simple, it's just, oh, never mind kind of line. And then we get to see what would happen if Killmonger had the resources of Tony Stark. His values don't change, but where his original plan was relatively subtle, his new plan involves mini Gundams. And for the fourth time in this six episode series, we kill Tony Stark. So that's neat. On top of all that, the writing in this episode was the best the series has produced so far. Killmonger and Tony's conversation comparing the two characters really hit. The difference between you and me is that you don't see the difference between you and me was genius. And this is another episode where every voice actor is performing at 100%. It definitely helps that Michael B. Jordan has enough experience with voice work to bring all the necessary emotion through the medium. And Mark Wingert did an excellent job at capturing the spirit of Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark. And this is for some reason the third episode in the series where Chadwick Boseman either dies or talks about death in an unbelievably poignant way. I don't know how much of this was planned, knowing that he was sick, but if it was not written that way, this is an insane coincidence. Overall, this series is a lot to like. Sure, there are some things that I'm not a huge fan of, but there's also plenty of things I like, and I am totally looking forward to episodes 7, 8, and 9, as well as season 2. As always, huge thank you to everyone who continues to support the channel on Patreon. You guys are amazing. If you want to see your name here, get access to videos early, other cool stuff. Like, you know, I'm, I'm really good at that. Like, I just, I just completely didn't even think. Brain on autopilot there. Okay, so if you want to see your name on this scroll, which is so, it's so cool. And I see the names. I'm like, oh, all those people, they're really cool. There's some people that don't have names on the scroll. And for them... I realize I'm saying scroll, and it sounds like I'm saying scroll. Maybe it's a northeast thing, I don't know. But there's some people that don't want their names on it, and if they message me, I'll just put them on a list that I take them out before the thing. So if you're like, I don't want to have my name on a video, then you totally don't have to. You just let me know when you become a patron. We also have the book club. This month's book, we're reading Radiant Black, which I have not read yet. I'm excited for. And we do monthly whiteboard videos. Not sure what this month's one is going to be about, but we do voting, and one got way more votes, so it's probably going to be that one. Also, listen to the podcast, Mostly Nitpicking. That's Mostly Nitpicking. I realize I kind of rushed through that one, too. Mostly Nitpicking. But Mostly Nitpicking. Every week, me and my friends DJ and Diggins pick apart a piece of pop culture by looking exclusively at the details. We just did an episode about a movie called Malignant, which I cannot necessarily recommend because it's real it's real weird but it's pretty interesting and it's fun to hear us talk about it so you can listen to it wherever you listen to your podcasts we are at nitpicking pod on twitter last thing speaking of twitter follow me on twitter instagram twitch tiktok all that stuff twitter mostly i am at nando v movies on all of those platforms that's all i got stay safe and i'll see you next time <laughs>